Okay, so today, um, or recently, I've upgraded a number of my um, Linux distributions that I have on my computer here to a 64-bit version and the version of a, of a new release. Um, I've pretty much recently been kept keeping up with Ubuntu and I fell behind with SUSE Linux and I upgraded that and I've upgraded to Fedora 15, Mandriva 10.02, and Slackware 13.37, and Linux Mint 11 on my computer here. And now I'm going to go over just, um, I'm just basically going to do just a basic overview of uh, what various choices people find uh, when they go to a different distribution. And I guess my, my approach is, is going to be uh, to start out I'm going to I'm going to look at each one of these distributions as if I was a brand new user um, and I'm going to just discuss various things that I found problematic even as, as a somewhat experienced um, Linux desktop user uh, to get things working the way I wanted to, uh, what I liked, what I didn't like, and the strengths and weaknesses of various ones, and um, I'm also going to try to have articulate or outline just a basic principle that there are, of the issues that come up with people that use Linux, there are basically two general categories, either it's impossible. You can't. It can't be done just yet. Because, uh, assuming the the user has no programming skills, or um, there's some kind of barrier to actually doing what the user wants to do for various reasons. Either it's um, ease of implementation, it's a mis miscellaneous security issue. Um, it's unclear documentation or whatever, so I'm going to try to go over all these things, point them out, so we won't do them again. So I'm hoping I'm trying to help out, even with all my rants up there, or, or, or you know, my videos about you know Linux sucks or whatever. I'm, I'm trying to point out what what goes wrong, so we could fix it at least from the perspective of someone that isn't really a programmer, but. Um, really wants to use <laughs> Linux on his, on his desktop. And I have a number of test platforms here and um, got a lot of disk space. So, you know, decided I, I have on my system, I got Windows 7, Ubuntu 11.04. Those are 32 bit systems. I got Linux Mint, OpenSUSE, I got Linux Mint 11, OpenSUSE 11.4, Haiku Release 2 Alpha, Fedora 15, Mandriva 10.02, Slackware 13.37. On, on this computer, just got through f finishing where they're all installed, and they can I can boot into them, and I've done a few things here or there. Um, and I'm also just going to gloss over some things that some di difficulties that I had, just because I had older in versions of these installations in, in my in my computer at one point, um, which is either either reflects the fact that my the version of say Ubuntu I had installed is was more up to date than the package I'm gonna get into and therefore it was out of sync and there were where it used to be usable it isn't usable anymore or anyway so I'm gonna get into all these different complications okay so where do I start off um, I guess I'll start off with Ubuntu because that's what I'm in right now um, and I'm just going to give give my opinion. Now, there's always going to be someone out there that's going to say, well, I disagree. Well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, just because I say so doesn't mean that you're wrong forever. Obviously, I'm complaining, and the development in for various things hasn't really gone in the direction that I want. So perhaps I'm wrong, but um, who knows? Now... I'm going to point all these things out as really kind of like, I don't know, just 
just the way a critic would, I guess, but with the hope of it actually getting better. Um, kind of like, you know, you... just a very indirect way to kind of explain this there is there are shows out there where people have like top chef you know their chefs go out and they compete against each other to be better chefs and they have critics come by and discuss what they liked and what they didn't like about the dish and then you know people pack their knives and go home well none of the distributions are going to pack their knives and go home i don't want any of them to do that um but still you know whatever you know, the chefs may have walked away with being a little bit better of a chef because they, they learn by their mistakes, etc. Now, obviously this is a free product, and I'm just talking from the viewpoint of just a user who has an opportunity to use Linux, and, you know, can they or can they not actually use it to on their day-to-day -day things? Um, and in fact, that's my my primary approach. It doesn't matter what any other operating system does. It really matters what the operating system itself, as it arrives to the user, that's what matters. So if it if in the condition that it arrives, it doesn't allow the user to do what they want to do, even in small ways or in larger ways, then those are things that that theoretically ought to be changed for usability. It could be drop dead ugly, but have all the functionality that you need at least makes the barrier. Now, in thinking about all this stuff, I was also thinking about having, or at least naming, or at least trying to name, certainly it isn't carved in stone, but um, I think it should be discussed or put out there at least to start, and then it can be amended. Um, pretty much, uh, it'd be a set of standards that a desktop would have, and I'm not talking about where the config files are located or things of that nature. I'm more or less talking about usability standards. Um, and I guess I could just start reading off some of the ideas that I jotted down, just give you an idea as to what what I mean by that. So, it's just a list that the distribution says, we've done all these things, so the user knows, or at least knows that the person that made the distribution has asserted they have done all these things, and therefore they know they're going to get a certain level of usability out of the system as a result. Okay, so, and I don't know what to call it. This, you know, the Linux desktop standard. I, you know, I, I, who knows, right? I, I'm far from official. I'm just one random person. But at the same time, there is no real official body that's going to say this is what the official set of standards are or are going to be. And so I'm, I'm sticking my neck out and just going to do it. And I'm sure to be criticized, and it's fine, right? I mean, <laughs> who might criticize something if I can't take criticism? So let's put it at that. So some of these things may be framed a different way, worded a different way, made more, more universal, more portable. I, you know, I, these are just things that are off the top of my head to start with. One, um, this stand if the distribution were to assert that it was up to this standard, it would be able to say that it can guarantee that certain packages come installed with it. So you know that when you install it, if they say conforms to the blah the blah 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 standard, whatever it is I'm making up right now, just pulling out of my ass. The you know, Linux desktop conforms to the Linux desktop standard. Let's just say, for example, it will have in it an installation of Firefox, or it will have in it an installation of Bash, or you know, Bash is probably too specific, but 
evolution or you know and then then we get into if we will begin to the place where we're picking and choosing you know which is the right or which is the flagship application but Firefox you know pretty much everybody's going to agree that's a flagship Linux browser now the other ones not necessarily um, it could be more generic and I'm thinking that would probably be a better way to go so the distro guarantees it has an email program that can send emails receive emails and conform to a POP3 standard and an IMAP standard you know it could all be laid out that way right and then it, it, it could guarantee that it has a camera program for example like for example GUVC viewer that I'm using now that will capture the video and it will be in sync under certain parameters and spell that out um, that it has the ability to read a USB stick when you stick it in and it, okay the next so that you get all these things so we, we basically someone somewhere will hopefully someone will do it uh, dream up a list of things that a basic list of things that every desktop really should have as a base install just to start with now if someone says GNOME or it's got to be GNOME or it's got to be KDE now it's got to be either GNOME or KDE I would say uh, what about F XF yeah. sorry <laughs> XFCE I don't know the last time I used it it was just wasn't really intuitive I'm just going to tell you how it is and I'm going to treat it as truth okay then the next set of standards would be that the next set of guarantees that the distribution will be able to make is that the configuration files you used during the install will be good through so many releases uh, I guess I'll diverge a little. Okay, so Ubuntu, you know, Ubuntu has, you know, long-term release, you know, long-term support releases, and it, you know, it's argued, well, you know, they'll support it for three years, and then, okay, well, three years, three years is a pretty good amount of time, but you know, after a couple of years, you kind of, you know. If I were using Ubuntu, let's see, uh, 904, I wouldn't really have Firefox 4, I don't think. I don't think I'd be able to use WebGL. Not not that that's <laughs> anything to write home about, but, you know, <coughs> you know, <coughs> I wouldn't have the latest VLC, and you know, things would work a little bit differently. In some things, there would be, you wouldn't have the benefit that you would if you actually moved up to 1104 and really in all practice uh, <laughs> the, the release pace I, I do think is too fast but um, nonetheless um, keeping up with those releases allows you to have the latest and the greatest of everything at least in my opinion in most cases now sometimes things break but what I'm trying to say is is that if you If, if there were still such thing as a, a, a x386 config file <laughs> for example if you had you can use your x386 config file from two installations ago to four you know it's just some kind of guarantee like that that you know settings won't change as a result of a new new upgrade it may be harder to do in practice um, <laughs> and that would kind of it, it would kind of like be a um, a way to for the distributions to kind of expect of developers to kind of keep things stable in that way okay um, then there's another set of standards that, that I'm going to end up going into in this whole presentation 
as I discuss these various uh, uh, latest Linux installations that I have installed in my system right now. And the way I put this was it would be a guarantee that the user will have adequate control of the system without tedious tinkering. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll just get into it right now. So one thing that comes to mind is, um, for example, uh, Mandrake 1004 uh, ships with... Uh, if you have KDE on as the default, I at least know this much. If KDE is on as a default, you can't log in to KDE under the graphical user interface as the root user. Um, you know, there's debate. I've seen people go and make posts and, and say, well, you know, how do I enable the root user? And then someone comes and scolds them and says, oh, you shouldn't do that, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, at the, at the end of the day, people got to do what they got to do. And sometimes it's a matter of efficiency. So if you're moving files over from, for example, in my, my situation, I first cleared out all the part, all the files I had and all these different partitions before I did a, just a fresh install because I was moving up from 32 to 64-bit installations and all of them. And I at least get the general impression that you can't do an upgrade from a 32 to a 64-bit. you got to do a new install. Well, I don't want to lose all my data. And I don't want to be doing this stuff forever at the command line or some, you know, weird way. Um, and sometimes it's very convenient just to log in as the root user and just copy everything over to some USB disk, and you're done. Okay. Um, sometimes it's a lot easier to, you know, things are so damn tedious to get working. It's a lot easier to work from the root user because otherwise you would have been typing your password 15, 20 times that day. Now I know sudo can can hold the password for a little while, but you know, you can't expect everybody just to know that they're supposed to use sudo, first of all. And second of all, some people like to do what they do with the mouse and not with the command line. Now, yeah, I know there's something called GK sudo, but you know, I, I've never tried launching GNOME <laughs> with G, GK sudo as a root user. You know, I, anyway, um, just just the the one thing, just that one barrier of not being able to log in to Mandrake. For example, I all I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, go into all my different setups and. Apparently, when I had done one of these installations, I deleted my swap partition. I needed like three or four installations, and none of them had a swap par partition. And I ended up adding it later, and I wanted to go back in and just add it. And, you know, the easiest thing to do is just click on my computer, go up to the etc. directory with the mouse, find the f file systems tab by scrolling down on the scroll bar and clicking on the the file system tab file and it'll, you know, kwrite or gk edit will open it up for you and just edit, file, save, and you're done. Well, you <laughs> can't do that in Mandrake. You can't roll that way. You have to at least know that, uh, and then when you try to launch um, kwrite from, uh, from sudo, from, uh, sorry, for, you mean try to launch sudo at all, it, it won't even let you do it in Mandrake. 1002 says, you know, James is not part of the sudoers list, and then um, you try to do GK, just the SU super user, um, that's what I call it, um, and then launch Kwrite, it just crashes. So I, I had a URPMI Emacs, you know, get it down there and do it that way, and that worked fine. I've done that a great many of times, but that's my way of working around the fact that I'm stuck in a shell. Um, I wouldn't be surfing the net and going to every drive, you know, surfing drive-by download sites with my, you know, logged in as a root user. Sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a matter of basic security. But uh, KDE doesn't even ship with uh, the user login disabled. 
Now, I, I recall that when I first installed Ubuntu, I think it was 704, the system has moved from 704 to 1104 without a problem, um, which is very good, by the way. Um, I remember I had to give myself the capability to uh, use SU and then log in as root at the shell, and also give myself the capability of um, logging in as root graphically enabling root logins graphically in Ubuntu. I, I, I remember that. I don't know if it's doing it in 11.04, but nonetheless, that's one prime example of a barrier. Another barrier that had ta historically taken place, but I haven't seen lately, was just the simple ability to administrate cups from the browser. Um, and this happened a lot in, in SUSE, probably 8, 7, in that area, where uh, you know, CUPS, the printing system for, for Linux, has a, a web-based interface that uh, if you go to your, open up your web browser, you, you, know, you put the address 127.0.0.1 in your, in your web browser, which of course is localhost, the machine itself. Um, I forgot the port number, I think it might be 631, if I remember right, then you can actually add printers that way, or you could delete printers, do print test jobs, you can add PPD files if you have a model that the PPD didn't come shipped with uh, with your computer. <coughs> you pretty much do almost everything you need or want to do with printers except for HP printers uh, in that interface. And it was a real, real nightmare just to get permissions to log into that interface as root. And that's what I call um, security overkill. That, that's that, that's what I call you know it's intruding upon uh, the end user's real ability and choice to actually just do what they want to do with the system. Okay, um, that's why you have a root user. <laughs> that's why you know it already has the you already have to log in as root to use the interface. You don't need to disable the ability to use root. That you already have security, you only two, three, four, five, six levels of security. <coughs> the next part of this standard that I was that I dreamt up was that um, is that the, the environment can will guarantee under a set of guidelines that they that the distribution issues That'll um, that'll guarantee that if a proprietary vendor ports its application over to it, that it will run for the next X number of releases without issue. And so, you know, the op directory comes to mind, or the user directory comes to, comes comes to mind as being places that that those apps could be. Can be placed, but at least you know work on a standard, and then when they release their distribution, to make sure that they've conformed to their own standard, you know, so that when whoever the vendor is can can release their <coughs> um can release their apps and know it's that their porting efforts would have you know been worthwhile, and they don't need to change their porting efforts every year or two years to keep their app running in Linux and that way they could actually expand upon the features of their Linux version or release it. That stability is very important. And um, now, you know, because the only thing that's really within the realm of the impossible is um, our pr proprietary apps that don't run in Wine. <laughs> if the proprietary app doesn't run in Wine, it's impossible to, to do that kind of work in Linux. Everything else I see is possible in Linux. Um, the camera I'm using right now, I didn't look on a hardware compatibility list. I didn't look for, you know, to see whether there was a camera program out there. I just trusted that there would. There's enough saturation in, um, in support in, in Linux land for drivers that it's actually safe to do that now. And even in apps, it's is close, but you know we're there. Um, so those are those are the basic standards that I had in mind. Now, now I'm going to get into these uh, different distributions. Now I'm going to say right now that um, I think Unity 
for Ubuntu, Unity was a step backwards. For every single distribution, and I'll make a more general statement, for every single distribution that I tried, every one of them, um, the fact that they didn't have KDE 3 in there was a step back. And I'll, I guarantee uh, it is. Um, and I'll, I've, here and there, I've, I've mentioned a few things that, that I don't like about KDE 4, or that I don't like about GNOME, and um, it's not because you know the menu bar in GNOME is on the top or the left, or, or the, the borders are brown instead of blue, you know, the, all that stuff, like I said, um, it can be dropped dead ugly, but the functionality is there that allows the user to do his job better, I'm all for it. And so, Sure, you know, let's say, now for example, I've, I've backed up a number of files from other partitions, and sometimes I've done it as root, and sometimes I've had files that were saved in the root directory that I, that I backed up, and now they, you know, they're still owned by the root user, but they're on a, you know, mass storage device over here, this little, I have a if I'm ever going to pick up. There it is. <laughs> um, they're on that, but user zero is root in all these systems. It's still going to be owned by the root user, whether I copied it in Slackware or I copied, copied it in Mandriva or whatever, under those situations. And yet, yeah, sure, you know, I could do the change C H O W N recursive and give myself ownership on that drive from the command line. It is a universal way to do it. But isn't really some, no one's really going to just know that. You know, they're going to have to search for that answer on Google, and it may take them a good 20 minutes to figure out what it is, and they may even come across false positive results. Um, there are a lot of false positive results, and maybe not for that command itself, but for other things, um, old solutions that don't work anymore because things changed. Um, it gets to a point where. You know, unless you can just do it um, <clears throat> in in an intuitive way, then you, you, it's a step back for for the user. And you know, like it, this is what I'm talking about with XFCE. So when you go to XFCE, if you don't know that you got to click the mouse to get menu selection items to come up, you're just gonna wonder. What do I do with this? I'm in some kind of window and I can't get out. <laughs> that happened to me once. I panicked, you know, about five years ago, and finally, you know, I clicked left and right on the mouse, and finally, something kind of, oh, there's something, and I figured out I had to right click on the mouse to get, you know, the thing to open up and, you know, log me out, and then I could log into KDE. You know, people aren't used to that kind of thing. If, you know, if every computer out there, every, if everybody knew, and almost all the operating systems out there, if everybody knew that right-clicking on the mouse brings up a menu and it was a universal, just everybody knows that kind of thing, okay, that's great, but it's not. And so it's it's counterintuitive. And the same thing goes with, um, <coughs> with uh, changing ownership. So, for example, if I want to change the ownership of the files uh, on my iOmega there, I, the natural thing I would do is in Ubuntu is I go up here to places and then I go to removable media and I click on my um, terabyte file system and I'd see it and I right click on one of these directories and then I click on properties and then I'd look for permissions and then I would you know change the user you know and then I would want to apply the permissions to the enclosed files. Well, I found out. Um, not too long ago that when you do that, in fact, it, the easiest way to do that is by logging in to the graphic user interface as the root user. <coughs> but I found out recently that even though you say apply to all the files inside, it doesn't apply. You actually have to dig in and you have to select all the files within the folder, do it that way, and then go down another level. It just doesn't work in GNOME. That even though it says it does, it actually doesn't work. Um, things like that, 
kind of make the feel of uh, using the operating system kludgy. It slows the user down. You get log out. I mean, the root user log in as a, you know as a root user in the graphical. Go find it. Right click, and they find out it doesn't work. And they got to dig in, and meanwhile, they know the you know. Meanwhile, I know in the back of my head when you did that in KDE, it worked. It worked just well. Um, KDE three. <coughs> the natural thing to do in KDE four is to um, if you want to if you want an icon on your desktop, um, could be to right click on the desktop and look to see. Is there a create an icon option here? Well, there is a gnome, but in KDE 4, no, there isn't. Um, and then, you know, if you had a little more experience, you know, you know that somewhere in there there's going to be a place to put the terminal command to get the thing to come up, pick your icon if you want to do it manually that way. The problem that we have right now, at least in GNOME, is if the application doesn't show up on the menu bar, you're screwed. And that's especially true for KDE 4. Um, you're not necessarily screwed in GNOME because you can create the launcher, and if you have a little bit of experience, you'll, you, you'll figure out that these launcher, launchers are just pictures that point to getting something to run from the from the command line, um, <coughs> without you know, with hiding all the the output that shows up in the command line. Uh, so you you know you figure that you can probably create your own launchers in GNOME, but not not KDE. If you want to put your if you want to put a device on the desktop in KDE, doesn't necessarily work. All these things. Now we've got this new thing, this this Unity window that, in my opinion, is just awful. Um, I disabled it in my 11.04. So now I now if I want to scroll up and down, I don't have to guess where the little scroll bar is. If they're wondering whether I, I don't understand this whole idea about real estate on, on on the desktop, and that optimal real estate on the desktop is having no icons whatsoever, and having a you know having a, a and shipping Firefox so there's no menu bar <laughs> by default, so you can't if you if you you happen to want to uh, change the default page. Or look at your stored passwords. Well, you just gotta dig a little further to get to it. Um, that only really applies to cell phones, maybe, or small screened areas, but not not a desktop. And if you want to have something portable, well, in my opinion, um, you really should ship a <laughs> different version for the the cell phones that comes with that turned off rather than having the desktop users wonder well how do I change my preferences now um, another barrier was just you know just making it unclear as to how to get features that are kind of cool to work like WebGL you know, it's a pretty simple thing. You just go to about config, and you you have to put in one of the lines there. You have to you have to type in the location of your OS Mesa lib. You know that that's it, <laughs> and then it works. But you you know if you don't know that, or the documentation out there is unclear, or this blog has do these three things, this other blog has do these three other things. Um, I didn't really figure out that that's the way to go until I actually went into about config from the contents of a blog, looked and saw that it was actually asking, you know, what's the name of the file of my Mesa libraries? Okay. <coughs> Getting back to the standard, one thing that I forgot is um, one thing that they should guarantee is that they're going to, if you put, if you, they guarantee two things. One, so they're going to ask you during the install if you want to install proprietary drivers. Ask the user. Um, that to me is a good compromise. It isn't just putting the proprietary drivers without asking the user and not giving the GNU project a chance to have it say at that point, but at the same time it's not leaving <coughs> an end user with an un unusable system. Um, and also, once once chosen to be installed, it's going to you know part of this standard I've made up. They're they're, they're going to guarantee it's not going to uninstall.
under any circumstances unless you take action to, to uninstall it, even during an upgrade. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to get into these specific distributions, et cetera, et cetera. I'm also going to, I'm also going to do for Windows, too. And, uh, so that way you can judge whether I'm a Windows fanboy or not, <laughs> which I'm not. I wouldn't mess with these things if I wanted to use Windows forever. Okay. I'm going to take a short break and I'll continue with part two.